I've been living there um, for um, about five and a half years um, in March 2020. And obviously, uh, we were all starting to become aware of the pandemic that's now um, in the news all the time. But at that point, um, I started to notice that uh, a lot of people were leaving Egypt and testing positive for COVID um, when they returned. And so I, because the Egyptian government wasn't exactly being upfront in terms of their data collection, which is pretty normal, unfortunately, for the Egyptian government, um, I did some reporting and spoke to scientists who had modeled the likely size of um, the COVID-19 outbreak in Egypt at that time. This was at a time when uh, the Egyptian government officially said they had three cases and these, um, these uh, Canadian scientists had modeled um, the size of the outbreak in Iran, in the United States, in countries all around the world. But in Egypt, this proved to be a problem. Um, and uh, they estimated that the likely size of the outbreak at that time was between six and a half thousand to 45,000 cases. Mm. Obviously quite a, you know, a, a large amount of um, possibility there, but that's what happens when you don't have real data to work with. It's a scientific model. Uh, the Egyptian government were uh, furious that I had cited this scientific model and stripped me of my press card um, and then quickly began uh, pressuring me to go to a body that is run by the security services in their words so that they could see my visa. Um, and at that point, I got some information from, um, uh, I'm a dual national, German, British national, I spoke to um, the German embassy who said, we don't think you should go to this appointment, we believe that you're going to be arrested. Um, and pretty soon after that, the um, British embassy informed me that the Egyptian security services were asking me to leave the country. That request I assume was not as polite as the way that they phrased it um, and the message was pretty clear which was that I had to leave or I would be arrested. Um, there, there are journalists, uh, Egyptian journalists, one in particular Mohamed Munir, who was arrested for reporting on uh, the COVID-19 pandemic after I was expelled from the country um, and he actually got COVID in prison and died. So the stakes of this are high, the stakes of looking at the reality of the pandemic in Egypt and its effect on Egyptian citizens is extremely high. And what the government said to me when they brought me in for in, um, a kind of interrogation with the head of the state information service, um, which is the body that issues press cards, but they're also in communication with the security, um, is that they said that I was spreading panic by talking about uh, the likely size of the outbreak. And that's obviously stayed with me because the idea that you would be informed about the reality around you and the, the real nature of a viral disease that has you know, obviously affected us all in some way, but that you would have good information as a random citizen about what's happening, that that is a threat, I think really says a lot about their attitude, not just towards journalism, not just towards press freedom, but also towards basic science and how you think about reality. So that gives you some picture of what the situation is like for, for journalists. You know, it's funny, I mean, I, in, in, I think it was 1998, um, I had my visa withdrawn um, as well. But, you know, I never feared being arrested. And in fact, in those days, um, I think that, you know, there was a sense that you had a protection and that, that certainly that Britain, I mean, I'm a British national, would back me. Um, and there would be a kind of outcry if you were arrested. Um, you know, Al Jazeera has had someone in jail for four years and it, 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 you know, look, it was reported on some very fine journalists, but it was kind of just accepted. I mean, do you think that that has happened when someone's regime, like in a military regime, like, I mean, I know he was supposedly elected, but it was a military regime um, that, you know, is, is just kind of tolerated in the West in, in, in a sense that it wasn't perhaps 20 years ago? I know you weren't well, working. Of course. <laughs> I mean, um... I think that there is, I mean, we've seen unfortunate tolerance towards dictators all over the world from Western nations for, for decades, unfortunately, right? That's that, that part, unfortunately, is not new. I think what is different is that 
governments now, I mean, I think particularly, for example, um, the French government, the British government is probably also quite a good example, but, um, you know, the French government will happily sell, um, you know, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi plenty of weaponry and they'll sell him surveillance equipment, which he uses to spy on citizens and journalists and all kinds of people. But they will also turn around and, and then talk about press freedom and not see those two things as mutually exclusive. And uh, or rather, they don't see them as interlinked. They view them as mutually exclusive, sorry. And I think the British government does this as well. The German government does it, which is to say, oh, well, we, you know, we have to sell these dictators weapons, which is in many ways the only thing that they care about, as long as businesses are coming in and money is coming in, they view that as support. And then if, you know, if Sisi has to stand up next to Emmanuel Macron, who gave him the Légion d'honneur recently, or he has to stand you know, next to next to Boris Johnson and, you know, they sort of talk about, um, you know, his leadership or maybe they, they make some kind of criticism about human rights or press freedom. That's a minor embarrassment that they just have to weather. And I think journalists get caught up in that as well, that um, journalists, foreign journalists, especially um, domestic journalists are not prioritized at all in that discussion. That's that I think that that is, you know, the welfare of journalists is increasingly sidelined. Um, and just one thing that I wanted to add, which is that in this context, you know, we can talk about press freedom as something that seems quite theoretical um, and quite expansive. And I think the one thing that this situation in Egypt really taught me is that sometimes press freedom can be extremely, it can function in this very bureaucratic way where governments actually have lots of opportunities to influence and do things about it, and they often miss it. And so it can be something as simple as making sure that journalists can have press cards where they can operate legally. Egypt cracks down on this all the time and doesn't let journalists work by not issuing them press cards. It can really affect how you're able to work in a country like that. Um, where these things are mandatory and you know foreign governments have every opportunity to be able to influence the Egyptian government to make that happen and sometimes they miss those opportunities it's very easy and they could do it and they uh, often they miss out. You mentioned there about surveillance the sale of cryptography um, which of course is a, a very um, significant earner for, for western countries the state of Israel as well um, and particularly in the Middle East and I think that, you know, in terms of this whole discussion, we're framing it at the changes that have taken place perhaps over the last decade, the last two decades. And that probably comes, you know, up the top of the kind of issues that journalists now have to be concerned about. Um, so, you know, Tim Dawson, I mean, your group, an expert group on surveillance. Um, tell us about it. Thank you. Yes, I'd be delighted to. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, the group that I convene is, is a part of the International Federation of Journalists, which is the organisation that brings together journalists, trade unions from all around the world, about 600,000 uh, journalists in, in all. Um, my own union, the National Union of Journalists in the UK and Ireland, is, is one of its larger affiliates. So that's what the, that's what the IFJ is. It's worth, I mean, before I talk about surveillance per se, it's worth and, and I, you know, because I appreciate this is quite a general audience and, and I was asked to kind of explain things from first principles, just to understand why the surveillance of journalists is such an issue. And it really is because confidential sources go to the root of uh, a lot of good journalism. Uh, I noticed the other day that an old friend of mine, Andrew Jennings, um, had died. Um, he famously is the man who uh, kind of really undermined a corrupt regime, both at the International Olympic Commission and at FIFA. Uh, early in his FIFA campaign, he sort of shambled into a, a press conference at which the FIFA high brass were announcing, oh, I don't know, the draw for this cup or the television rights for something else. And he attracted the attention of the chair and he said, uh, my question is, Mr. Sepp Blatter, I want you to tell me about the bribes that you've been taking. And of course, there was no way that Sepp Blatter was going to put his hands up and say, oh, yes, of course, now you ask the question, I'll detail more for you. Jennings was thrown out of the press conference. The press conference was closed down. It was all, you know, FIFA hoped it was just a kind of minor embarrassment. But what he had done was announced that he was the person who was interested in corruption at FIFA, and he was gambling that there would be lots of people in the middle management of that organisation who would feel like he did, that it was wrong, and would want somebody to discreetly hand information to. And that ability to, 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 to uh, take confidential information in absolute confidence, the, the, the kind of holy grail of journalism that we protect our sources, that, we, that they remain confidential, is at the heart of why surveillance is so important. 
I mean, we learned uh, if there was any doubt in August uh, just how systematically journalists' communication devices were penetrated when Forbidden Stories ran their, you know, fantastic expose of the Pegasus software, which were being used by, I don't know, nearly 20 uh, pretty un, 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 um, unwholesome regimes around the world to listen in on journalists and to try and work out who were the sources passing information uh, about their nefarious practices but I mean to be perfectly honest for all that that was a fantastic story and you know there were at least 180 journalists on whose phones the software had been found including incredibly the editor of the Financial Times in London um, you know a lot of this really we've known about for quite some time you know Edward Snowden's revelations showed that the National Security Agency had profound listening uh, apparatus that allowed them to to spy on almost anybody in the the uh, US population and probably around the world. Um, in fact, at a meeting the NEJ had at the Home Office, um, people who I think we can be fairly confident were MI5 officials admitted to us that there weren't phones in the UK that they couldn't turn on and listen into if they wanted to. Um, before the Investigatory Powers Act in, 90, in, in uh, 2016, um, there were a whole string of cases where, for very lazy reasons, police forces particularly tapped or, 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 or looked at the communications data of journalists to try and work out who had leaked pretty minor and uninteresting stories from Windows forces. So we know that where, where there is the capacity to snoop on uh, digital communications, it's almost irresistible for those who can do it if they do it on scene to try and do so. So what the what the IFJ's, uh, in fact, we call the working group on, on the surveillance of journalists does, is tries to collect information from around the world whenever we, we hear of cases where this has happened and share it in such a way that it can be dispersed as widely as possible in the hope that journalists can keep at least half a step ahead of the security agencies. But I mean, actually, it's, it's by no means just security agencies. Technology, which, you know, a decade ago was accessible only to state players, is now uh, widely available to criminal sources. So imagining that it's only if you're doing national security stories that these kind of things become a worry is, is naive indeed. I've spoken with people who develop software that that aspires to combat these risks who say, you know, there are at least 20 different programs, which in one way or another, without your knowing it can infect your phone and can provide other people with information and data about what you're doing. So trying to keep the concern about that at the front of journalists' minds really is, is, is a large part of our purpose. I mean, part of that actually is saying to journalists, um, don't assume that your smartphone is your friend. It's a fantastic tool. It's really useful. All these apps are brilliant, but there are occasions in your life when it's better left at home. And if you're going to do that, it's as well to try and develop working practices so that the one time that you leave the house without your smartphone isn't the time that alerts people who are watching you um, to, 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 to that being when you're going to go and meet a confidential source to so try and build up patterns of work that would confuse those who might use your your, your smartphone to um, to snoop on you. I mean, actually, the, the, the NEJ in the UK has just launched um, a kind of a whole suite of online training modules uh, under the banner of NUJstorysmart.com, free to use by anybody who wants to do so, which includes modules on how you can A, make communications devices safer, and B, tradecraft practices uh, to, to try and make journalism safer and more effective. And it's worth, I mean, <clears throat> I noticed uh, earlier this week that the uh, Investigatory Powers Commissioner had, had, had produced their annual report in which they detail the surveillance that's been undertaken on, on journalists' phones in the past year. Now, when this legislation was passed, I mean, th there had been a raft of notorious cases, Tom Newton Dunn's phone records being, being searched to try and find out who had leaked to him about Andrew Mitchell, the plebgate story, you know, really you know, not stories that were in any sense of national importance. They were just annoying to the police. Um, when the Investigatory Powers Act was, was passing, the NEJ and lots of other people, the Press Gazette ran a very impressive and effective Save Our Sources campaign, said to the government, we believe that when uh, 
agencies like the police want to look at a journalist's phone records, they should have to go to a judge in public and to explain why they want to do that and let it be decided by a judge in public. Now, the government turned that down and they said, no, the legislation they passed means that for a police force to look at a journalist's phone records, they have to go to a judicial commissioner, which is essentially, it's like a judge, but they can do so in private. So they can do so without the journalist knowing that it's happening. But if the evidence of the investigatory powers commissioner's report is, is to be believed, and I have no reason to think that it isn't, the, the very fact of that process has reduced the number of applications from scores every year to literally half a dozen, most of which were turned down. And that's been, I mean, that was the result of a kind of mass campaign by journalists and journalist organisations that even if it didn't get quite as far as we might have hoped was genuinely effective. And you can, you can point to it and say that really has made a dramatic difference to that particular route to surveilling journalists. And I mean, it says to me, I mean, we're running a campaign at the moment in the UK about the Official Secrets Act, which you mentioned, the government are planning to reform it. Uh, and in their consultation, they talk about treating journalists more severely than foreign agents, which is frankly a terrifying prospect. But our success with the Investigatory Powers Act makes me think it really is worthwhile saying to people, you know, take that issue to your, to, your to, 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 you know, find out a bit more about it and then go to your own MP and say, this is why I'm concerned about it. This is why I want you to act in my name when you're in Parliament. This is why if you believe in a free society, if you believe in a free media, it's vital that we don't allow this kind of legislative creep to impinge on the area where free expression takes place. I mean, John Rees, do you, do you see this somewhat dystopic view of a mass surveillance society and, you know, governments um, basically uh, bypassing the kind of human rights and protections that journalists had, particularly also on whistleblowers, which of course is what Tim Dawson began um, speaking about, the need to protect whistleblowers. Um, I mean, do you see that in the last decade, and you know, remember the backcloth of, of, of Assange, Julian Assange and, and, and his leaks and you know, Edward Snowden, um, do, do you see this as a pattern that we should be concerned about? I think the the urge to do this is certainly certainly there inside the institutions of the state and inside this particular um, uh, government um, at quite a an advanced uh, stage. And I guess one of the one of the points I'd like to make is that um, the question of uh, the ability of journalists uh, to do their job without state harassment is. Um, inevitably and integrally linked to wider questions of freedom of speech and freedom uh, to organize. And this government understands that very, very clearly. The things that it's doing with regard to journalists, if you look at the police bill, at the official secret, new official secrets act that uh, um, Tim's already uh, mentioned. If you look at the Materials uh, emerged. Here, John, and could you just fill, fill us in a little bit more about those two acts and and, uh, and what they would mean, or at least if they become enacted? Well, the the police bill is uh, one that's um, destined to make the whole business of political activism a lot, lot more difficult than it is at the moment, and still stay within inside the law. Uh, I mean, uh, Pretty Patel is advocating this. Um, on the grounds that, it, it, for instance, um, if you make a um, if you make a, a noise which is irritating um, residents in the area, um, then you're conducting an illegal demonstration. Well, you know, I've organised a good many demonstrations in my time, including the um, 1.5 million march against the Iraq War, and uh, it's pretty hard to do an effective demonstration without. Um, disturbing the neighbourhood, really, and probably most people would say it's impossible to do an effective demonstration without doing so. So if this were taken literally, if the police were to act on the powers that they would be given under this, um, it would make the business of effective political protest essentially I illegal. Uh, I think the, the Official Secrets Act, I think its most chilling aspect is the one that, that Tim's uh, mentioned. They are taking a leaf directly out of the United States uh, prosecution of Julian Assange, which is under the 1917 Espionage Act. 
um, if he's taken to the United States and ends up in a court in the United States, that's the act he'll be charged under. There's never been um, a prosecution of a journalist under that act. It is obviously uh, meant uh, to deal with espionage, as its name uh, suggests. All this stems from uh, Mike Pompeo's um, speech when he was uh, head of the CIA, saying that he regarded uh, WikiLeaks as a, uh, a non-state um, espionage organization. Now, there's a non sequitur. Um, mm. Espionage is about one state spying on another state. Uh, a non-state espionage organization is something which is trying to put something in the public domain. It's not handing it from one secret state to the secret service of another state. It's self obvious, it's self evidently trying to put it in the public uh, domain. So to recategorize the business of journalism as espionage brings with it uh, a, an enormous uh, a baggage, a, a dangerous uh, baggage, because it is, uh, and the Official Secrets Act will encode this in British law, it is beginning to treat journalists as if they are spies. Well, John, I mean, that's happened at Al Jazeera in America under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, a similar kind of thing. Um, and I remember, in fact, when I joined the BBC, um, as I say, 40 years ago now, I actually signed, and I was forced to sign the Official Secrets Act, but I, I at that time regarded it as somewhat antiquated. I think it was from 1911 or something, you know, a, a rather sort of, um, you know, ancient piece of something that meant that perhaps, you know, you, you know, it, 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 it didn't really have any relevance to me at the time. But what you're saying now that if I were to find you know, serious wrongdoing, for example, involving British soldiers or involving any institutions of state in terms of extrajudicial killings or anything like that, and I report that, that could be deemed a crime under the Official Secrets Act. Yes, that, that's, exa that's exactly what we're talking about. And this is the point about um, the Assange case. I mean, it's extending the territorial reach of the United States Espionage Act uh, on a global scale. You don't have to be an American journalist. You don't have to be working in America. But if you expose things that the American state regards as its secrets, it can reach across the globe and use its domestic legislation to extradite you and treat you as a spy. And, and this is such a, I mean, it's such a fundamental uh, question because look, there are only really two sources of information, aren't there? There's official sources of information, what governments, government departments, corporations, uh, other institutions of society officially release to you. And then there's other information that you get from other sources, which hasn't been officially released to you. Now, if we're going to narrow what's reported down to the first category and essentially criminalize the second category, we aren't going to have very much worthwhile information at all. So it's a, it's a it's a existential question for a free press. Well, you know, this comes down to, um, I mean, I, I, absolutely. I think it comes um, or segues into the whole question of sort of what exactly journalism means today, because um, I mean, I, I, I personally take the, um, definition um, that um, Amira Hess, a, a very good Israeli journalist um, from the Haaretz uh, newspaper, I think she described it as challenging centers of power, that that defines what journalism is. I mean, Somnath, you know, but, but, but Bile, do you believe that many journalists working in Britain or people who call themselves journalists shouldn't do so because they're part of the kind of official government machinery that perhaps John was referring to. Uh, Phil, sorry, I just missed the first part of the question. Yeah, I was just asking about the sense of what actually it means to be a journalist. And, you know, I mean that in the context, of course, of looking at, you know, the growth in social media, the way that certain, you know, correspondents um, are, are totally reliant on official sources to do their jobs. Um, you know, and, and look, I mean, Chomsky referred to um, you know, most journalists as, as, as propagandists. I mean, I think he's a propaganda to, his, to a democracy, I think is what a bludgeon is to a um, dictatorship, or words to that effect. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> do, you, do you believe that the, the, the very definition of journalism needs to have clarity today? And when we talk about journalism becoming a crime, we're not talking about people who reflect power, are we, and amplify power through their journalism? I mean, it's, it's an important question, given the 
presence of social media and that, I mean, unlike becoming a doctor or an engineer, you do not really have to do a degree or go through a course to become a journalist. Anyone putting out information uh, can claim to be a journalist. But also as Ruth says, jour journalists and journalistic bodies have certain tools which allow us to perform. You know, accreditation by the government is a big one. Licensing that we have um, institutions behind us. So in one sense, as you ask me, that almost anyone with access to information and being able to put it out in a public domain can claim to be a journalist. Citizen journalism has come up in a big way. This also means um, that you become part of a huge noise machine and so much is being put out of this conversation around fake news, um, what itself is news, what kind of websites are there. So this is huge conversations. So thus, perhaps it is time, Phil, as you might be suggesting that it's time to redefine or rethink who is a journalist? Is it somebody who is state recognized and that itself becomes a problem? Is it somebody with a recognized journalistic body or is it anyone who has access to material and can put it out in the public domain? Because putting, it out, putting things out in the public domain has become much easier. Mm. So um, I guess there is a question to be asked that are journalists the ones who question power? Are journalists anyone, anybody who has information and can put it out? Citizen journalism is a big, a big question in this regard for especially for Western journalists and organizations who cannot reach several parts of the world due to various constraints while people from those parts can put out information. Are they, can they be considered journalists? Are they trained in journalism? What kind of protection do they have? So yes, all these questions um, do come up when you ask who today perhaps is a journalist. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, what, Tim, what would you say about Amira Hess's definition there, someone who challenges power and therefore one should restrict entry into journalism? And I, I say that in the context that, you know, I mean, like when I started, you know, at the BBC, it was considered, you know, an, an, an elite group of trained intellectuals who became journalists. And, you know, it didn't, it was not speaking to a popular voice and it didn't, it denied entry to people. It was white Oxbridge, you know. Um, I mean, you know, how do you get around this problem of defining journalism, making it a profession and yet making it democratic as well? Well, I, I, there's a number of things I'd want to say. I mean, the, the, the first is that clearly, um, there is import in uh, journalism which challenges governments and major corporations which holds truth to power and at some levels that's that's the kind of journalism that we all want to talk about but I think that the threats and risks that are uh, growing to journalists go far wider than that I was I, I, I spoke at a meeting earlier today and it came to me that um, I, in, in, in the past two or three years, I have twice defended people who predominantly wrote about beauty products who were being uh, bullied by cosmetics companies. Now, I don't think any of us would say we're going to go to the wall because the people who write about beauty products are having a hard time of it, but they are one end of a spectrum, just as are people who write about football. People say, well, you know, it's, a, it's only entertainment, it's only a game, or we, some people here might feel more passionately about it, but but that spectrum of, of trolling people on social media, um, you know, that's only one step to chasing Nick Watt down Downing Street. So I think that all of these abuses of people doing journalism are serious, important, and a part of, of a whole scene. Secondly, I, I think it's easier to talk about what is journalism than what's a journalist. Um, lots of people, you know, it, it's perfectly possible for somebody who, how, however valuable might be training and experience, it is perfectly possible for people without either to produce competent and important journalism. And I think it's it's that product and the ability to produce that kind of product that we should be defending rather than going to the wall over whether in this territory or that territory you have to have a degree to be a journalist or you have to be a member of a particular organization. I think looking at, 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 at the quality of the work that's done and saying, does this meet reasonable tests of uh, separation of fact and opinion, of accurate information gathering and so on, if, if it meets those tests, and can be called journalism, then that's something that I'm in the business of defending. Um, somebody who might have got a degree in journalism, but is writing uh, dishonest 
uh, bent copy in which they're introducing uh, things that didn't happen to try and justify a case. I'm, I'm, for me, that's, I, you know, that th th they can look after themselves. Well, Ruth, let me bring you in on that because you know I, I was in in Tunis. I think, I think it was actually eleven years ago. The, the, this week or next week, I think, wasn't it, when the Ben Ali regime was toppled in the beginning of the Arab Spring. And on several walls, um, it was painted, um, thank you, Facebook, um, on the walls um, through, throughout Tunis, because it was somehow, you know, Facebook was something that, that actually was, was a, 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 a motivator, an engineer of, um, you know, the, the Arab Spring and certainly the um, uprisings in Egypt and Tunisia. Um, I mean, has something changed? And, you know, obviously now Facebook is accused of genocide in Myanmar. I mean, you know, what's going on in, in your view? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm going to disappoint you by not standing up for Facebook. No, I mean, I, I, I think what I will, um, what I would say, first of all, to, to just to continue on from what we've been saying and to link it to what you've just said, is that, look, we have to stand up for people's ability to share information, whoever those people are. And when I was talking about, um, you know, this idea around press cards, those are important in countries that authoritarian regimes that want to define who can share information and say that if you share information that we don't like, that means that you're not a journalist, um, which, you know, authoritarian regimes are very uh, fond of drawing those kinds of arbitrary lines, because then they can punish you by taking your press card away, for example, which is then when we need um, you know, outside intervention or intervention by some external party. Um, in terms of the role of Facebook and people sharing information, I mean, well, I mean, what changed was Facebook changed their algorithm somewhere around, I believe this was um, somewhere around 2016 or 2017, they claimed that it was um, going to help people just talk to, you know, uh, people people in uh, their sense of community, I would argue that I don't want Facebook defining what a community is for a number of different reasons. I don't think that private um, organizations um, should be able to, to define community, but that's personal opinion. Um, but they, when they changed the algorithm, it increased um, polarization and meant that people were predominantly sharing faulty information with like-minded people that wanted to hear that faulty information, which resulted in a number of different things, including um, some of the events that we saw in 2016. So, you know, in terms of talking about standing up for the right to share information, I, you know, I just want to agree with what's been said before, which is that, yes, we have to stand up for the right of people to share verified factual information that's in the public interest but at the same time I think we just have to be very careful getting into a discussion of who is and who isn't a journalist because the moment that you start to draw that line in terms of the person and not the information that's being shared and whether it's in the public interest and whether they should be protected in their ability to say it and to share it on any platform whether that's social media or in um, you know or in a newspaper or an online publication I think when you start, when it starts becoming about the person and whether you like them or whether you like what they say, as opposed to whether what they say is true or relevant or factual or relevant to the public, then we move into a situation that I think is more dangerous territory. It's much easier to stand up for the information at the start than it is to- How can to you verify anything on social media? I mean, how can, you, how can you verify something on Twitter? And, and you know, if I can say, I mean, it's a business model that basically profits from conflict and hatreds, and obviously the business model improves once you get people fighting each other. Um, I mean, is that not pretty sick uh, that that should be the case? Well, okay, so I, I, I listen, I'm not obviously gonna advocate for the things that Twitter and Facebook have done to increase conflict, but those are also human choices that have been made with the algorithms that dictate these platforms. So, you know, there, there is human input and decision making on the part of these companies there. It wasn't always the case that Twitter and, and Facebook or any other form of social media was being used to stir conflict. There are, you know, algorithms are not things that just fall out of the sky. They're programmed by human beings. And, you know, I think that we are right as a society to hold Facebook and Twitter accountable for the human decisions, the policy decisions that they've made. 
Um, and I think that's that's the way to proceed because these things can be used as tools for proper communication, as, as tools for sharing accurate information and people can be held accountable for sharing bad information in public. Um, but you know, it's it's that's a choice that we make as a society. It doesn't just happen. I mean, John, John Rees. I mean, can I bring you in there? Obviously, you've been, you know, a phenomenal activist um, over the years, um, and we'll come back to the polarization of of, of social media maybe um, in a minute or two. Um, but John, I mean, how do you see something social media now and how it's changed? And the key thing, surely, is how those people on it who believe they are journalists or believe, uh, or you know, okay, they are journalists but whose views can be controlled by others. Um, not unlike you know, Chomsky's basic view of manufacturing consent. And we've seen perhaps in the Middle East how governments have now, um, as it were, taken over from what was happening in, 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 in 2011 um, and managed um, through uh, political methods or uh, more, more robust methods um, to keep the message um, of rebellion um, off social media. I mean, how do you see how that's evolved and how does that relate to sort of journalism and, and the, the problem of uh, the criminalizing of it, particularly when, when, when people are accused of, for example, as, as Ruth was, of, um, you know, causing discontent or false news and, you know, these kind of things are actually enshrined in law in many countries now. Yes, well, well I, I think, this speaks to the point I was making earlier. You, you cannot sensibly separate the idea of a free press from more general questions of free speech and of the freedom to be able to organise politically. Because once you start trying to divide that spectrum up, you are handing an argument to those who want none of, uh, none of that. And I mean, you know, Egypt, I mean, I was active in, uh, in Egypt on and off for 10 years. I was one of the organizers of the Cairo uh, conference. I was in Egypt for nine out of the 18 days that brought down Mubarak and, and afterwards. And, you know, it, it was absolutely clear to anybody operating in that environment that the ability to effectively protest and the ability to effectively speak freely and the ability to effectively have a free press were all intimately connected in fact the only time in modern egyptian history when those things existed was when they existed together in the period of the of the insurrection against uh, against mubarak and since then uh, you know uh, Ruth, my experience is the same. My political contacts in, because I made a couple of documentaries when I was there, my political contacts in, in Egypt say, you can't come back to Cairo now. Don't think about getting off the plane. And when I think about what happened to uh, Giulio Regini, the Cambridge, the Italian Cambridge doctorate um, uh, student who was uh, tortured and murdered by the security services, I take that kind of advice very, very uh, seriously indeed but the same but the same applies you know not uh, in any in any con in any context i think that um where there's unaccountable uh, either corporate or political power is where we have to aim the criticism you know when when facebook changed the changed the algorithm it was in part to limit political uh debate and there were a very large number of people myself included who got chucked off that uh, platform I, I never knew why. I mean, I'm back on it. I just created another account, but I, I don't know why that account was closed. I wrote to my MP. My MP wrote to Facebook, asked for an explanation, never got one. Now, you can't have a platform as powerful as Facebook, which doesn't feel that it even has to give the bland standard template boilerplate reply to a member of parliament. That's an unaccountable power. And it shouldn't be and it shouldn't be that that way. Yeah. Well, you know, just to bring in um, Somnath actually on, on this point and to internationalize it, I mean, we'll come back um, in a minute to the whole question of uh, polarization. But I mean, obviously, we've heard from Ruth and John about Egypt. Um, I mean, the Narendra Modi um, government in India seems to have um, restricted political debate, um, restrict, you know, criminalized journalists, um, listened into them, as we heard um, one of the panelists say earlier, obviously using Pegasus. Um, I mean, just tell us a bit about India, because um, I lived there at one point and, um, you know, India 
was always a relatively free society, uh, maybe dominated by a certain caste, and you know it had its, its perhaps its issues, but it was relatively free. Um, how would you say that things have changed there? And is that an example that can apply anywhere else around the world? Um, India has changed. Um, when were you there, Phil? Just to I, understand I, I, the, the no. <laughs> change. I'm afraid it was in the early 90s. Um, so, uh, right. So I was, a, I was a, much again, but it was when uh, Rajiv Gandhi was killed. There was an uprising in, in, in Punjab at that time, the Khalistan movement. So it was uh, around that uh, issue. Right. So, so um, Rajiv Gandhi was in the late 1980s. So uh, the 1990s was more Narsimara, the Congress government. Yeah. Um, and a lot of changes were happening around uh, the 90s. And it's, you will see the strains of it today, uh, in today's um, how the government performs and how the press performs. Um, there are two sides to it. One is India is the largest news producer in the world. In, in the amount of news that is produced, the number of television channels that it has is more than the United States. So let me put in a little bit of context here. In 1998, India had one news channel. By 2010, there were over 350 news channels. That was the kind of explosion India had in privatization. Talking about the Modi government, since 2014, look at last year, 67 journalists were arrested. Last year, seven, um, seven, uh, seven, four journalists were murdered, seven imprisoned, one was burnt alive. You know, the, the horrific stories of intimidation, intimidation, physical assaults, trolls that are set upon you is, it, is something very equivalent to what Ruth would have seen in Egypt. So in one sense, we have to look at India, supposedly the world's largest democracy as not a democracy today. So that is one way we have to view it to understand what it does to free press. Having said that, they're brave journalists, some few organizations, especially online, who managed to carry on the business of journalism and holding the government to account. Uh, so you can so, have this. So now can I just inter interrupt you there? I mean, this is a key question in a way. Okay, there was, you know, the state media, it was sclerotic, it was ossified, it was, you know, all that. But I mean, do you think that democracy is healthier now than then when you have people like Modi? controlling political institutions, controlling journalists, running Gujarat like his fiefdom, you know, the, the way that the BJP under him has managed to influence power in, in India is phenomenal. So, you know, this is the, I suppose, a key point. You've got this maelstrom of, you know, social media, people discussing this sort of house of Babel taking place. I mean, is it actually a, a better world as, or, or did, are we looking at journalism becoming a crime that perhaps it wasn't? Um, when it was a more elitist or at least a more minority profession, you know, 20, 30 years ago? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important question and it's difficult to answer yes or no to this, simply because when we are talking about that ossified state television news network, which was called Rajiv Darshan, because there, uh, I mean, a vehicle for Mr. Rajiv Gandhi. So that was one way of looking at it. And uh, now with over 350 news channels, most of them owned by, the big ones owned by the top industrialists very close to the Modi government. So you have a very different kind of media environment. But let me take about a couple of minutes to explain this beyond the repressive state apparatus which you have and which is very easy to understand. And if it was only the state which was working against journalists, I would have had hope because state uh, governments change. But there is something more fundamental which has changed in India and Indian media post the 2000s. And I'll just take a couple of minutes to explain this, if I may. So in the mid 2000s, so in, nine, in the 1990s comes the structural reforms brought in by the IMF. And then the entry of foreign media happens post 1990s, Murdoch comes in and there is this explosion. So of course, when you have a state-run channel, the funding is from the government. When 300 channels are in play, everyone is fighting for an advertising pie, as we all well know. And then comes the demon of television rating points, where everything is done for an imagined audience. Uh, when I, had a, I did a one-year ethnography of 
two of Murdoch, I was, I sat inside two of Murdoch's news channels, one in, in Bombay and in Calcutta, before I wrote my PhD thesis and my book. I found that journalists were far more concerned about TRP ratings and audience ratings for their shows than any of the sales team or the marketing team. It was journalists who obsessed about the success of their program and what sells. And this selling became the most, so where selling and selling to a particular kind of audience which can buy particular kind of products, which was a middle-class audience, which was always being targeted by television channels. This changed, Phil, if I may, what journalism and investigate, the scope of investigative journalism in the country. It uh, took away incentives for good journalism and rewarded journalism, which could easily sell or be easily understood. And this started in the 2000s and carried on as big media houses brought over CNN and IBN being a good example or terrorized out of existence any good journalistic organizations and business models. Advertising started to be stopped. People started, so my, my old organization, New Delhi Television, not only did the government send the income tax and enforcement directorate after them, they found all the advertising uh, donors just uh, refusing to fund the channel anymore. So on one hand, therefore, you had the state coming down, you had journalists themselves rethinking what journalism meant and what was rewarding to be a journalist. Because after a point, journalists must also be seen as people who want professional advancement by removing any incentive from good investigative journalism you rewarded some other kind of journalism. And then the takeover of the media by a very small number of industrialists, very close to the government, that kind of killed this space for investigative journalism. And therefore that is what I mean by when I say, this is not only the state apparatus, but an ideological change. And that is where the fear comes from. Having said this, India is a big country. There are still, newspapers struggling for space and money uh, who carry on this very important business of investigation. Mm. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd argue, and I, I, I certainly would, and I, I mean, I take, of course, Tim, Tim Dawson's point on board about beauty products. I mean, I think that those journalists who wrote about those beauty products are investigating power, and, and that's as legitimate as anyone else. But I mean, I wouldn't know whether I'd say that the Kardashians are legitimate journalists or you know, journalists who basically reflect power and amplify it. And I mean, do you, do you, do you see, Tim Dawson, do you see this as, you know, very much what, what Chomsky wrote, uh, you know, on manufacturing consent, that, you know, the kind of things, you know, that, that Somnath is saying, that people's careers get enhanced, um, all of these kind of things. And of course, you become a criminal. I think Chomsky found various ways that journalism were, were, were ostracized, you know, first of all, the careers, that. As, as he once said to somebody, I think that, you know, um, you're not being, you know, there's not a puppeteer running you, but, you know, you wouldn't be here asking me the questions if you didn't agree with the power. And to that extent, um, do you think that we are, you know, that that is something that's becoming even more relevant globally now, that dictatorships are, are maybe a thing of the past, but that manufacturing of consent um, is, is, is even more powerful now than even when Chomsky wrote about the United States. And perhaps to those... Oh. Can I Sim, can I just quote, the beauty of the, so I've written this one down to get it accurate. The beauty of the system is that such dissent and inconvenient information that is challenging power are kept within bounds and at the margins so that while their presence shows that the system is not monolithic, they are not large enough to interfere unduly with the domination of the official agenda. I mean, that's something I pulled um, earlier today from um, Manufacturing Consent. And by the way, if people haven't read that, you know, those of you viewers, I would certainly recommend it. But Tim, I mean, do you think that is something that I, 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 more relevant now? Well, I, I, I think that there is a view that, um, you know, the mainstream media is, 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 is a monolith in which the kind of pressures that you describe uh, govern who gets where and what attitudes they take. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, to be honest, I don't think you have to spend very long in an actual newsroom to realise that it's a far more... Um, 
variegated, disputatious, eccentric place than that description, if, if, if I'm being completely honest. Um, I think, I mean, for all the um, issues that social media throws up, um, the the fake news, the trolling, the you know the the the, the fact that these um, you know the the the, the, the uh, high temples of information that we recognise from twenty five years ago have been exploded, and there are hundreds of alternatives. Means that any sense that um, there is a kind of priesthood of information that perhaps you might have argued once there was simply d doesn't hold now that brings with it its own issues it it, it it really and truly does but there are lots of people who have found you know uh, journalists who've been sacked in in shocking positions i mean the one that comes to my mind is suzanne moore um uh who is able to set up a sub stack and get her material out whether you think is valuable or not valuable um and continue to make money from it in a way that 20, 25 years ago would be simply unimaginable. Now, you know, that's why, you know, because of these techniques, because of crowdfunding, because of the passion that people often at the margins find, you know, some quite eccentric campaigns, some quite eccentric information sources can find funding in a way that never they did before. But I, I don't find that it's consistent with this idea of a kind of information monolith and priesthood um, that you're describing, uh, the, 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 you know, that the, the Chomsky describes. And I would also just say, um, you know, in terms of the issues that are thrown up by Facebook and Twitter, I mean, they are profound and they are real. But the very case that you made earlier against them could have been made against newspapers in the 1920s, newspapers which which often some some peddled grotesque misinformation, some, you know, Pulitzer's chain famously caused an actual war wholly through their own endeavours. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, you know, newspapers are, are a very different, um, you know, they simply don't hold that kind of power in a way that I suspect in 20 or 30 years time, we'll reminisce about the days of Twitter and Facebook and their apparent um, omnipotence. And, think, well, you know, isn't it funny that we imagined that, that, that they'd just be with us forever and that their power was such that it would never be challenged? Whereas I think the all the evidence of technological change and information change is that dominant as they might be now, it will ultimately be a short-lived regime. I mean, you don't think, and, and John Rees perhaps put this to you, um, you know, that we're, we're, you don't think there's been a danger that social media has divided Britain. And, and obviously, you know, one thinks of Brexit, immigration, um, you know, these issues that were off the table at one time um, in terms of multiculturalism, for example, it was never questioned by this monolithic group um, that, uh, that um, Tim refers to um, prior to maybe 9-11 and perhaps even, I would say, that multiculturalism in the UK really got questioned when social media started, not in, 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 in 2001, but in 2010, 2011. And you find that, and we've done investigations of Islamophobia and seen that the rise in Islamophobia has almost paralleled the rise in um, social media usage. Um, and do you think that maybe that even the tabloids in Britain are trying to catch up um, and that, you know, Britain um, is a more divided place now than it was maybe during the Olympics in 20, 2012? John, I think, I think it is, um, and not just Britain, uh, but not primarily because of, uh, of social media. I think the society is more divided. I mean, how do you want to look at that? The gap between the rich and the poor, the number of billionaires in society, the collapse of the political center, uh, the emergence of uh, right-wing populism. Uh, it is a more divided and fractured political culture and social media reflects that possibly perpetuates it as possibly has played a role in it but isn't the sole or main generator of it that's the failure of uh neoliberalism the disappointment of the collapse of the of the welfare state era and much more significant um social facts of life than than simply uh social media i think and i think it's very important to look at things developing in this way not just through the lens of the media and what journalists do. I mean, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing consent is a is a fantastic uh, 
is a fantastic book uh, and what it says it is true about the way in which the media is structured. Um, but if you were to leave it at that, I think you would have a, a very one-sided picture of how ideas and debates and social movements and political struggles uh, take place. In, in fact, you would have, and I, I think um, this is quite a widespread sentiment um, uh, on the left as well as the right, you would have a, a kind of conspiracy theory uh, explanation of the way in which society changes, that there's this group of people at the top, they're controlling the media, they exclude voices that uh, don't agree with them, and that's how the system perpetuates its power. That's not how the system perpetuates its power, it's one aspect of it, and of course it's particularly relevant uh, to, to journalists, um, but there are many other ways as well. Um, keeping control of work discipline in the workplace is absolutely essential. Um, the fact that the anti-union laws uh, um, are very are, are the harshest in Europe in, in this country is not often talked about, but it's an absolutely fundamental question. And uh, I guess no government minister would dissent uh, from that uh, from that thought. And then uh, it's almost actually more radical to say um, the ways in which people don't accept the story they're told with the media. Because I mean, to be honest certainly for people on the left, it's not a very surprising statement to say that Rupert Murdoch's printing presses produce stories that by and large justify Rupert Murdoch continuing to own printing presses. I mean, that's shocking if you think the media is neutral. It's not that shocking for people who've had a look at it. What, what might be more shocking for them is that between 40% and 50% of Sun readers vote Labour. Now, what's going on there? I mean, we all know what the Sun stance is. How come if these people are being programmed by what the media say, they're voting in exactly the opposite way that the Sun would recommend them to vote? And that's because actually people aren't sort of, their heads aren't empty vessels into which the media simply pours bad ideas and they go out and act on them. They have their own experiences at work, in trade unions, in the Labour Party, with their family, um, in their civic institutions, and they form a, a, a counter narrative. And that's interesting. That, that's, and that opens a space because that's a space that journalists who don't want to go along with the mainstream story can relate to, can report on, can find an audience for. I mean, look what's been happening over the last few nights with the main ITV news. They've got the story about Boris and boy, are they whacking the government. It's like watching an editorial from Socialist Worker every evening. <laughs> um, well, listen, John. Thank you for that. I mean, let, let's you know we're coming to the end now, and and it's it's like you know when did journalism become a crime? Let's just focus on that question and in, in the background of Assange and 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 you know events of the last decade. I mean, Ruth, could it, do you feel you know where you are and being in the Middle East that the press, the the West, cares any more about press freedom and the protection of journalists in a way that perhaps it did you know, 10 years ago, that it was prepared to stand up. Now, hey, who cares about journalists? You know, we've got, we're too busy with other things in our lives. I mean, do you think, do you get a sense of that? Um, I think with any social issue, when we talk about unions or the importance of protest, I think it's always really easy to say that people are just going to kick back and say, oh, actually, my life is very busy and hard. And actually, people can surprise you. Um, and I, I don't think people feel that way. I think that People now more than ever understand why a free media is important because we started to see what it looks like when you have elements of it taken away. Mm -hmm. And I think that what's happening with the policing bill um, and things like this in the UK, it, you know, I, it rankles me a little bit. I, I think, by the way, that what, um, you know, Boris Johnson's tendencies are towards the sort of flappy authoritarianism, but there's authoritarianism in there. But one of the things that tends to sort of make me cringe a little bit is if you see, um, you know, people in the United States, people in the UK, people in Western Europe looking at events, for example, in the Middle East and saying, oh, you know, drawing very close comparisons with um, what might happen in the West in a way that, um, you know, sometimes I think can, is sort of ignorant of their own their own privilege to sort of fight back against what's happening domestically um and 
I just think that, you know, we have Western governments have plenty of opportunity to care about press freedom and to be held to the, the standard that they've claimed for themselves. Joe Biden has made plenty of statements about how much he cares about human rights um, or how much he cares about press freedom that he's failed to stand up for so far. We should just hold him accountable to his own statements. The intention counts for a lot. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's that's on us as a society to hold governments to the standard that they've claimed they want to be held accountable for, whether that's standing up for um, journalists who are operating in the Middle East or other parts of the world. Russia also very good at detaining journalists, just as a random example. Um, you know, I think that we should just, yeah, it's, it's about holding uh, holding these governments to a standard that they've they've claimed that they want to be held to. And, and indeed, I think it's worth people knowing that, you know, the war against whistleblowers started with Obama, uh, not Trump. And, and indeed, you know, America's apparent lack of concern with journalists, which is probably wrapped up into the so-called war on terror and all of this kind of stuff that happened post 9-11, um, is, is, uh, is, is something that perhaps prevents the West being able to be a beacon for anything. Um, listen, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in. I'm seeing um, several now that have come through. Um, so. Um, let me let me pass it to various various people. Um, these are questions um, from the audience, um, and I think maybe this for you, um, Tim Dawson. Um, given the treatment of Julian Assange, should the UK and the US be allowed to talk about the lack of press freedom, free speech in other countries? I mean, should they just shut up about it, Tim? Well, I I, I mean I, I think those of us who advocate for a free media should relentlessly point out the in most particularly of the United States in in the way that they have, um, but also could have halted this bizarre process. So I mean I I I, I think the point is to to relent be on their case for so long as the sort of grotesque carnival of the expedition and prosecution attempt continues. No, but I mean, I suppose, Tim, the, the point is, and maybe you're bringing John here, I mean, it just seems so hypocritical to people in other countries, in Russia, people involved in Navalny and all this, when, you know, they see what goes on in the United States, and it really undermines their position, doesn't it, when, you know, they say these things, but yet do precisely the same things as some of the well, certainly those involved in any national security issue. Yeah, well, I think this is a very important dynamic to understand. I mean, I think Ruth's absolutely right that um, it's um, it's not very sensible when people make kind of comparisons with uh, authoritarian regimes and imagine that the same is true in um, parliamentary democracies, whatever their uh, very great um, weaknesses uh, might might be. I think it's it, it's better to see what the kind of race to the bottom is between these two types of state, because what's happening is that um, the regimes in America or in Britain are turning around and saying, okay, you know, we might not be perfect, but we're not like China, we're not like Russia. And mm -hmm. that justifies removing rights, treating Julian Assange as they're treating him or whatever in their countries. And then you have, as we had only a few months ago, um, the representative of the Chinese state standing up in a press conference and saying, hey, don't criticize us, look at Assange. Mm -hmm. And that's what the, the president of Kazakhstan said, look at Assange. So what you've now got is a race to the bottom where abuses on either side of this divide are being used to justify abuses at home. And that's what we've got to uh, uh, un unpick. It's not good enough that the Chinese state arrests and imprisons uh, journalists. It's not good enough that Navalny is in prison in Russia. And it's not good enough that Julian Assange is in Belmarsh. And we've got to stick to that argument, really. Yeah. Um, uh, Tim, there's a question actually for you, um, Tim Dawson. Um, what has been the most surprising thing you've discovered while being chair of the expert group on surveillance of journalists? Um, what's been the most kind of remarkable access that you found that institutions of state have had well I, I think i've described two of them i mean i was i was staggered um i, I you know it comes by slightly unofficial means but by you know when, when mi5 fairly openly admitted um that 
of course they could they could you know there wasn't a phone they couldn't get to. I, I knew that from I knew that from Snowden, but to hear uh, officials saying that fairly openly, albeit in a private meeting, um, kind of took my breath away. Um, I, a, a technology expert just before Christmas took me through the many pieces of software with which a mobile phone can be infected. And again, I, you know, I knew this abstractly, but to see that minutely detailed and how straightforward it is, not all of them are as powerful as Pegasus, but all have similar traits um, and realize just how porous a smartphone is, that, 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 that shocked me. Yes, indeed. Um, Ruth, there's a question for you, actually, a very precise one. I mean, can the Guardian operate anymore in Egypt? I mean, what, what's the situation for the Guardian there, if you can say so? Oh, I'm happy to say so. Well, I'm not happy to say so because it's not a, a happy subject. But I mean, um, it is largely unclear, but not very positive. So I was told um, when they took my press card away, I was pre presented with a very um, actually the most so probably the most beautiful gift that I've ever been given from the Egyptian government in terms of its sort of gold embossing and incredible presentation of this letter, which told me in very detailed terms that I am a terrible journalist and listed all the reasons why. Um, and so obviously at some point I will frame it. Um, and uh, it also said that the Guardian is no longer able to operate in Egypt. Um, I mean, what that means long term in practice, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, you work for Al Jazeera, you are familiar with um, the uh, constraints that certain news outlets have had operating in Egypt long, long term under the CC regime. Um, I mean, it doesn't stop me or other journalists covering Egypt. It just means that it is incredibly dangerous for me or particularly anyone that might want to talk to me, which is something that I take incredibly seriously. So it means that now when I um, do interviews with people in Egypt, um, I take a lot extra precautions because I realize that they're taking uh, more risk in talking to me than they were previously. Sure. Um, Somnath, maybe one for you, because it, um, I think it's applied generally, um, but, um, you know, India is an example, but um, somebody's asking, one of the audience is asking, would greater government deregulation improve press freedom? Um, this speaks to some of the things we were talking about earlier. Uh, maybe you could sort of embody that in a, in a simple answer. Uh, again, it's a, it has two sides to it. Uh, I mean, government regulating Social media, I think, is a need today. Uh, so, so not deregulation in general, but also government. Um, again, privatized media, non-regulated media has not been the answer to um, democracy in the non-West and I think the global South because of uh, private ownership has not worked out necessarily the way um, Perhaps it has worked in some, some countries in the global West. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think what I would say is this, that if we want to have a free, fair, impartial, strong media, we need to institutionalize media education amongst the citizens. Uh, without that, I can't see how um, a free media can work, especially in countries where democracy is, um, does not have very strong roots. Um, so rather than thinking government regulation, which has problems, deregulation also has problems as we find out you know, in America, in, in the UK, I think more educating citizens through you know, through early childhood, through schools, be making it a part of a curriculum might work in the long term of how the general public reacts to social media, news, information, and understanding and being more discerning readers. That might hold a key to a more sustainable journalism rather than government regulation or deregulation. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions here about a very thorny subject. Um, in fact, Naomi Wimborn Idrissi, who's a founding member of Jewish Voice for Labour, and those of you in Britain may not have heard much of Ju Jewish Voice for Labour because though they were a very large and vocal part of the Labour Party, they never got airtime. Uh, 
um, because they are certainly questioning um, the absolute right of the Israeli state to control and dominate Palestinians and question the very roots of Zionism as a legitimate political idea. By no means all of them, I think. I think it's fair to say a very um, a mixed group, but uh, certainly that idea um, is one that um, is somehow um, not something that the British media likes to touch in any shape or form. Um, and there, before we come to what Naomi had to say, question Jonathan Coulter to Tim Dawson, actually. Um, you say the reality is more variegated, but how do you explain the mono, monolithic ma mainstream media coverage of supposed anti-Semitism in the British Labour Party since 2015? We have seen the liberal media like The Guardian and the BBC leading the charge, saying much the same as the conservative media who could be expected to attack Labour on sectarian grounds. Now, just to give a little bit of background, Tim, before we go into that, I'm sure you're aware of the way that anti-Semitism was used to depose Corbyn and to undermine his legitimacy as Labour leader, um, even though, and I think everyone on this panel would know that in no way is he anti-Semitic whatsoever. He's been campaigning on anti-racism um, since, you know, the very, since he, he entered politics. Um, so, I mean, there's just a, an aside there that um, the British media was pretty monolithic. You look at The Guardian, if you looked at the John Ware panorama, um, you know, which was a, a knife job, um, in my view. And uh, by the way, Jewish Voice for Labour had no voice in it um, for, for probably very deliberate reasons. Um, I mean, Tim Dawson, isn't that an example of, um, you know, Chomsky at work? I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I, I think it would be interesting to see precisely quantified um, how much uh, attention um, any particular side in that dispute, I mean, which I'm in, in, in no sense an expert in, but I'm, I'm very conscious that when people are very bound up in, in a particular campaign, um, whatever it might be, and as I say, I don't speak specifically of that one, that um, it's very easy to find themselves thinking, why is there not more of me in the media? Um, why are you know why have my opponents in the papers today and not me um and 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 to draw the conclusion from that that they are some in some way being excluded i know i mean just to give an ex example that i'm i'm far more au fait with um i, I know during the um assange extradition hearings which i attended every day of i covered every day of i wrote every day about in a print newspaper Paper, albeit not a very widely circulated one um, and lots of the people I spoke with outside the old Bailey said what why are the Guardian not covering this and as I didn't work for the Guardian at that time I you know I, I didn't know but I went and counted the number of pieces that had appeared and I think over a month I think maybe 17 had appeared um, you know which might well have been not sufficient to satisfy those, you know, the the, the hyper interested, but was a great deal more that they, than they seem to be giving credit for. Now, I'm I'm very familiar with uh, with 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 the name Jewish Voice for, for Labour. I can tell you the names of, of 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 several of their activists, not because I have a particular interest in their work, but I found that out from somewhere. So I, I can't help but think that perhaps they had slightly more coverage in the media than than than. Um, they are allowing for whether that's whether whether it's an amount that's justified by their size, mm. their influence, the amount of material they put out. I honestly don't know, but I, I, I think it suggests that they've been ignored by the media, which I, 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 I sense is the pretext of this. Um, doesn't accurately reflect oh, you mean the reality. Idrissi, she uh, says here, a friend from Media Diversified sent me a video clip she had posted on Twitter about a protest we had been on last week against the Nationality and Borders Bill. Um, what I am to make of the fact that I carried, that it carried this warning, she says, um, the following media may contain sensitive material. This media is not available. It's content you've chosen not to see. Um, A, she says, I made no such choice. And B, the video clip was actually of her speaking. Um, I mean, John Reese, do, do, do you believe that there are issues that are taboo, like, for example, uh, a robust critique of Zionism um, without it being equated with um, anti-Semitism that is uh, sort of not, not able to have a voice in the British media? Well, I think it's obviously difficult. And uh, I mean, there's a, di there's a distinction between saying that the media is in general biased and saying that it's monolithic. These are two different things. The first statement, in my view, is generally true. The second statement is not true and it's misleading. Uh, and it's disabling, actually, for the uh, for for the left. 
And so I always think you have to contextualize what the media is doing, which isn't to absorb it, but it is to put it in its proper perspective. The reason why it was so difficult over the question of anti-Semitism is because practically the entirety of the Parliamentary Labour Party agreed with that argument. So the political spectrum from the far right through the Tory party, through the Liberal Party, uh, right through uh, to the far left in the Labour Party, all agreed on the anti-Semitism argument. And I might say, I don't think that even under those circumstances, um, some of the uh, hard left did a particularly good job of defending Jeremy either. So in a way, they made anybody in the media who wanted to pounce on this, they made their job fantastically easy because the amount of people resisting it was a comparatively small part of the political spectrum. Now, as I say, that doesn't absolve journalists of a responsibility to, to articulate a different argument, and especially when there's a kind of, you know... Uh, more running on this, it's particularly important that journalists take the responsibility of amplifying the voices of those who are on the receiving end of that mob more than they did. But the context is in is important, I think, and it and it, and it hides a distinction between um, reporting and political power. The people who are doing this are people who have the political power to do it, which by and large. On, uh, but isn't this why it's important, though, Tom? Sorry, if you're saying that the whole breadth of Westminster, as it were, and that defines the parameters of, of debate within the British media, then surely that's when journalism becomes a crime. And obviously there are pro-Israel groups yeah. who'd like to define um, anti-Zionism in such a way that to make it a racist crime. So isn't the very role of journalism is to question that consensus? The interest yeah. should not be about where there's a division within that but those who challenge it from the outside, just like Assange did, just like the people who have suffered, just like Ellsberg, Ellsberg did. And in a way, that's what the Jewish Voice for Labour, they're trying to say, yeah, actually, well, absolutely. And, uh, and, and Palestinians, but they can't get a voice for that. And it could become criminalised. Yeah, no, I agree with that, obviously. And that's why I said is it, there's a particular, when you have a sort of Garadine swine rush towards a particular argument like that and we all know what that atmosphere feels like we all know what, what what's happening when that takes place then of course there is an especial responsibility uh, on journalists to report an alternative uh, view of that and there is a legitimate criticism to say that not enough of them did that i, I agree but um uh, but it's a misunderstanding of the way in which politics is working to simply suit, shoot the messenger i'm not a, against sort of argumentatively shooting the messenger, so to say. But I just think that it's it, it misleads you about what the political force is generating it is uh, to, to isolate what the media are doing from the wider political spectrum of forces engaged in, it, in any of those in any of those things. And and conversely, with the um, with this the Assange argument, I mean, I haven't visited Julian in uh, in Belmarsh since um, COVID, but the last couple of times I did, he kept on saying to me, and I think it's a very important point, um, don't let people talk as if we're a minority. Actually, we've got to the point now where um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the majority of the print media in this country are campaigning against extradition. The problem isn't the voice, the problem is we don't have the power. So mobilize the voice to confront the power. And I think, uh, you know, um, exaggerating what an embattled minority the left is, is a disabling activity. Well, so, okay, so John believes empowering journalists, um, especially those who seek truth on, you know, from perhaps, a, I mean, in a way, I think all journalism should be left because you're challenging power, aren't you? I mean, the right tends to support power, but maybe that's another argument for another day. But I mean, just on the final, you know, we're about to wrap up now, um, Somnath. I mean, you know, if there is increasing hostility towards journalists, and this is a question that we've got not from um, our audience, um, how do we, you know, if you could be brief, I mean, how do we overcome that? And how, how can we create a safer environment for journalists to operate? Uh, again, uh, no easy answer, but as I felt that, as I said earlier, educating the masses, empowering the civil society, uh, lobbying as so many of you do, um, continuously uh, highlighting to various bodies, the kind of, uh, you know, 
many of you would not know that last year, 67 journalists in India were imprisoned because we are, have not been able to amplify. Uh, so around the world, what is happening, we've not, what happens in perhaps in the West, especially in Western Europe and America gets amplified, but other voices are not. So finding avenues to talk about journalists and their safety to bring it back into mainstream um, concern is possibly the way. We have seen that most governments are not interested. Um, so I cannot see uh, the state stepping in beyond this uh, lip service that the UK and the US, France and Germany seem to pay. Uh, except empowering bodies like the ones which we all represent and talking about it. And uh, I, I don't see, what I mean to say is I don't see the state stepping in. It has to be through um, civil society, journalistic bodies, which represent journalism and educating uh, the larger public. Mm. Ruth Michelson, what's your view on that um, as a final note? Um, my view on that is to say that I agree. I mean, I think that, yeah, again, if we leave defining what press freedom is to states, we will be in a difficult place. But I mean, I think that the, you know, again, record numbers of journalists are, around the world are in jail. And I think if we frame how we look at these things in a sort of disempowering way and in, in terms of thinking about um, you know, how we frame state power and what we can do about that and what does press freedom really mean? How do we stand up for it in an active sense? I think it, it, it is of benefit to society to, you know, to think about how we empower the public to do that rather than to think about what we don't have. Um, because I think that's, you know, that's how we make press freedom a more expansive thing. That's how we improve society. Well, Tim Dawson is doing this. Um... Tim, obviously, uh, John Reese thinks I'm a moaning mini and I should actually be much more positive about this. Um, so, um, Tim, you're, you're actually doing something about it. Um, how do you see that, uh, that we can create a safer world? I think the single most important thing is for journalists to stand together. I think I think it's to understand the importance of what we do and the fact that we do it in a contested space and for us to support each other. I confess, I, I don't, I, I think there's something dangerous about thinking that um, that which is left is good and that which is right is bad, not least because the notion of what's left and what's right is in itself contested. I think those who are honestly and sincerely trying to truthfully represent the world as they see it, even if you disagree with them, are people that you should, you, as, as a journalist, that we should endeavour to support and act collectively and to develop a, a, a common sense of what it makes us and what it is that we all need to defend. Okay, I think we, we, we got you then. Um, no, absolutely, absolutely, Tim. I suppose my point is that challenging power isn't often something that the right and, and right wing journalists feel is in their blood, if you know what I mean. Um, but again, that's probably part for a whole new discussion. Um, Nina, um, is there anything you feel we've left out you'd like to bring in here? Um, to be honest, we had a, a few more questions um, from our audience, but unfortunately, it looks like we're not going to be able to. Um, have them answered today. Um, otherwise, we were probably going to drag on um, for a bit longer than we we've told people. So I think we're gonna we're gonna end things there. So um, uh, thank you, Phil, for for hosting us this evening, um, and thank you to our panelists, to to Ruth, Tim, John, John, and uh, Somnath, um, and to the audience, of course. And um, just wanted to say to the audience, please join us next week for our second Journalism in the Firing Line event, um, which focuses specifically on the case of Julian Assange. And I know we spoke about Julian Assange this evening. Um, John Rees and Tim Dawson will be back um, for that event. That's going to be on Tuesday at 6 p.m. And it will be live streamed from SOAS University. And if you're in London, do come along um, for more details about the event or to learn more about ICOP please visit our website or just follow us on Twitter at SOAS ICOP. Um, thanks again to, to Phil and to our panelists. And um, we hope that you can join us again for um, some of our future events. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. Right.